You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah, and this is episode 252. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with a dog walk or A-frame? The Hitaboard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hitaboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today we're going to be talking about how to integrate tugging into your training. And before we even start talking about integrating tugging into your training, we do want to say right off the bat that you do not have to tug with your dog to be successful at agility. There are plenty of dogs out there at all levels of competition who use other types of rewards besides tugging and play and are competing at a very, very high level. Um, so, you know, just know that. However, we do enjoy tugging with our dogs and it has a lot of unique benefits, uh, reward placement, ability to throw that are a little bit harder to replicate with food. And so if we can get a dog to tug, we like to get a dog to tug. Totally agree. You can definitely get clever with food, and we certainly have even with some of our own dogs, the, the older generation of dogs, before we really discovered the benefits of tugging. But the new development, at least here in America, for the American Kennel Club, AKC, is that of FEO for exhibition only because you get to take a toy into the ring. Notice it's toy. Not a bowl of food, not a pocket full of treats. And so that really leaves uh, food-trained dogs a little bit at, at a disadvantage, right? And so I think a lot of people are looking into tugging right now in a, in a new way, in a new light because of these rules so that they can get the most possible benefit from this new class of agility that the AKC has to offer. Uh, of course, other people know and have, have known for quite some time that you, your dog can tug on a leash as they enter the ring, except in NADAC. So if you compete in NADAC here in the United States, you can do that. You can tug, I think, on your leash exiting the ring, but not coming into the ring. Um, so having said that, and, and given that very good reason to really take a, take a look at tugging again, kind of with fresh eyes, let's get into it. And even before we talk about integrating tugging into your training, which I think a lot of people are missing, they think, well, I just teach tugging to my dog. Now my dog can tug. You know, they're pulling me around on the toilet a little bit. We're ready to do it in, in training. And it's not quite that simple. Tugging is actually a very complex behavior. So when we look at the mechanics of tugging at first, we like to divide it into five parts. And problems can crop up at any one of these parts. And so let's break it down. Number one is the chase. That's the dog's uh, drive and desire to uh, chase after a toy. It seems very obvious, but how many of you have a dog where if you roll something on the ground, they're not going to follow it? Or if you put a toy on the ground, a place toy, they're not going to go to it. They're not going to drive to it unless it's moving, right? So two sides of the same coin. That's the chase. Number two is the bite. We need a dog who's willing to bite onto the toy. And this is where a lot of people have problems. The dog is, for example, mouthy. They have a soft grip. They constantly slip off the toy. Or maybe it's, they chase the toy and then they pounce on it, right? They're all about the feet. Yeah, they love the chase, but they uh, they don't want to bite it. They don't want to take it in their mouths. Uh, great point. And then number three is the fight. That's what we typically think of as the tugging part, right? The battle with people. Uh, dogs can definitely struggle there and uh, not really pull against you, right? So it feels like you're not tugging at all. You're just walking around with your dog with a toy in their mouth. Number four is the release. And here we kind of run into the other side of the spectrum, which is my dog loves to tug. I just can't get them to let go of the toy. Or people have dogs that tug so vigorously that it's dangerous for the, for the handler because they start whipping around their head and, and really transmitting that force along to the handler's arms. And if you got shoulder problems, that's just not something that you can do. And number five is the retrieve. And this is a huge problem. Many people have dogs that will not bring the toy back. And a lot of people are just satisfied the dog will bring the toy anywhere near them and put it down on the ground. And if they have to walk five or six feet to go pick it up, they're okay with that. Is it ideal? No. And I used to be one of those people. You know, I had the Border Collie Rook. I was like, I don't know, two, two, three dogs ago. And, um, you know, she would, she would bring it kind of close and then I would have to go and get it. But I was like, this is close enough. It's doable. But now that I have dogs who bring it all the way, I'm like, oh, how did I ever live without this? 
Like I didn't even realize it's you, like you a, can turn on your TV with your finger, yeah. but it's sure a whole lot nicer with the remote. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, I would have had to explain that joke to our children who've <laughs> never known what it is to serve as the manual human remote control for your parent. Um, so we have five different aspects, and as you can see, the fight or the actual tugging part is just one of five different aspects. So we need to keep in mind, and and this is the number one thing when we're thinking about how are we going to integrate tugging into our training, into our competitions. You need to have a very clear picture in your head. If you're going to get a dog on a tug toy, any particular tug toy, ball on a string, for example, how are you then going to use that ball on a string in a trial? So Sarah, you were talking about... Um, a couple of different points here. And so I wanted to hear a little bit more about your first example that you were sharing with me. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, we talked about the five aspects and, and what they all are, but let's think about, um, how it looks in a finished, uh, 10 out of 10 perfect tug behavior chain, right? And that would be that, um, I throw a toy for my dog. My dog chases it. My dog bites it, picks it up. My dog retrieves it back to me. Um, my dog then tugs with me, the fight, and then my dog releases on cue. And that would be the absolute perfect behavior chain with no problems in it. And um, in, in practice, we can get a lot of benefit from this behavior chain, even if there are certain pieces of it that our dog is not quite as skilled at. So we don't have to have 10 out of 10 on all five of these areas to have a functional tug, something that we can use in practice or in a trial. The fact is that we can get a lot of benefit if we have a subset of these five uh, different aspects of tugging. And let me give you two very common examples that I would consider pretty workable in terms of using a toy as a reward. The first is the dog that loves to tug, but has a very poor retrieve. So it, what this might look like in practice is um, you throw the toy, the dog does the chase, the dog does the bite, the dog is not going to do the retrieve because they would rather run around and, uh, you know, they're not going to bring it back to your hand. But if you have a second toy, you, they will come back to you to play with the second toy because they do have the fight. They want to tug. And if you've got that second toy, uh, you can actually mark your dog for, for picking up the first toy and reward them for picking that up with the second toy that will get them back to you where you can do the fight. And then if they will still release on cue, even though you only have four of the five, you're missing the retrieve. This is something that is very workable in practice because when are you ever going to be in a situation where you are allowed to have one toy, but not two? Like this is a situation where you're only going to be using this uh, tugging behavior where you are practicing, right? Where you have uh, the ability to have you can use more whatever than one toy. toy you, you can want. use whatever you want. So there's no real harm in having a two-toy system um, that lets you then use tugging as your reward. And this is actually a stage that um, we often get to fairly quickly with puppies, like right? Like an intermediate stage for teaching specifically the retrieve. Right. Because we've worked a lot on tugging, the retrieve, there is, they're still working on it, but we're able to go out onto the field and uh, use two toys and get a lot of work done that way. And uh, I think this works really well for dogs that really, really do love to tug because they will very happily, willingly run back to you to play the game of tug with that second toy. Right. Quick caveat here, because there are going to be people who are like, hmm, this sounds interesting. I'm going to try it. Uh, the second toy is not a lure. It can be the first several times, maybe a session or two, but very quickly, you have to be able to mark the behavior you're looking for, which is in this case, you throw the first toy, the dog picks it up, they start heading back towards you, click. You need a mark. When they're still like 30, 20 feet away from you, then you reveal the second toy. Right. 
right? So a lot of handlers, they show the second toy as a lure, begging the dog, please come over here, look at this toy, isn't it so great? Don't you want this too? Okay. And you can do that the first couple of times in order to get the behavior so you can click that behavior. But very quickly, you want to wean it off as a lure and then use it as, as it's intended, which is as the reward. So I, I want to throw that out there. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of people running out there wondering, why isn't this working? Right, exactly. Um, the second kind of partial chain that can be workable uh, in as a reward is the dog that will do the chase. Loves, loves to chase, loves to bite, loves to retrieve, doesn't necessarily love the tugging part. Well, you don't. Shilty. <laughs> <laughs> or even some goldens, right? They love the, sure. they love the retrieve. They, I mean, they're bred to retrieve. They're like, they'll retrieve all day long. They don't, aren't necessarily into the physical the act conflict. of tugging, the fight, right? And so you can still use your, um, use your toy as a reward with these dogs. You just leave out the fight. The fight isn't the most important thing. It's one aspect out of five. And, uh, it's interesting because at least to you and you and me, we still consider all of this, all five elements to be um, part of tugging, part of tugging, even though there's no tugging, here. even though there's no tugging here. And so, you know, when we're training this, this, this would, that would just be one, you know, the tugging is just one aspect out of all of these five, but that is very workable. When you think about it, in my opinion, when I was thinking about this, the fight is really for the dog. There's not too much benefit to the handler of the actual fight part, right? There's benefit to mm -hmm. the chase because you want to be able to have placement reward. You want to be able to throw a toy to, at a specific location, manipulate your dog's path with a toy. So the chase is beneficial to the handler. The bite or picking the toy up is beneficial to the handler because you don't want to have to go and retrieve the toy every time. The retrieve is beneficial to the handler. The release is beneficial to the handler because you need to get the toy back. The tug is really the thing you're doing for the dog. And if the dog doesn't want it, then you don't have to do it. Uh, I, so I think the pros and the cons of having a partial tug I think the pro is that you can go out and you can use this as your reward, even as you are working on whatever aspect of, of this five piece tug uh, you're missing. So that's the big pro. I think the con um, of the dog that doesn't really enjoy the tugging part of it is that specifically when we talk about FEO, you cannot throw the toy. So you're going to lose that chase aspect. You're going to lose the retrieve aspect of this entire uh, mm -hmm. five-part tug, mm -hmm. right? All you really have is bite, fight, and release that you mm -hmm. can do with your dog when you're using a toy in FEO. And so if your dog, you know, if their favorite parts are the chase and the retrieve, is it going to be a really great reward when you're just asking them to bite and release, right? Not mm -hmm. quite as much. So I would still encourage people to develop uh, that tug, to develop in their dog um, the the idea that the fighting part can be fun, can be a fun part of this overall game, even if they, you know, prefer the retrieve part. Um, and, and that would be the reason why. That I yeah, I think you make a very it. great point. And that's what you want to think about. So this goes all the way back to the very first point that I made, which is you need a plan, a big picture. You need to have a very clear vision in your mind about how you're going to use tugging in your training or competition. And things that are allowed in training, which is basically anything, whatever you want to do, lots of people come up with very clever makeshift things, are not necessarily, I, I love this term from uh, Sarah Streming, ring sustainable which means you can't be doing this in the ring because the, the rules don't allow it. And we also know a basic principle that we really uh, emphasize here on the podcast is that we want our training and our trialing to look as similar as possible in most respects. And so if you've got all this very nifty makeshift stuff you're doing in, in practice to make these toys work, that's great. But guess what? You're not going to be able to do that at the competition. And so that's why um, you, you kind of want to keep that in mind you want to be okay with that if that's what you can get and you're all right with that. But if you have a different goal, which is to use these toys um, into the ring, then I think you have to spend a little time thinking about how you're going to get there. And th that's what's so uh, important. Okay. So I think we've um, covered some of the big concepts here. 
Now let's zoom in just a little bit on tugging in practice. How are we going to integrate this into practice? What does that, what does that mean? Right. So, so let me, let me paint a picture of how we're going to take these five steps and, and how it's going to look in practice. Cause before we were just talking really specifically about what our tugging behavior chain looks like, but this tugging behavior chain is actually going to happen at the end of a handling behavior chain if we're mm. using this in practice. And so I'll tell you how I use this with my dog in, in the, in the most typical fashion. Like this is going to be the majority of my dog's, um, tug when I'm doing handling practice. I'm going to be doing a sequence, um, I'm either going to get to the end of the sequence or I'm going to find some place in the middle where my dog does something particularly good. I would be running with the toy in my hand and um, I endeavor to throw the toy so that it magically appears in front of my dog on my dog's line. And, and that starts the whole tugging behavior chain. So, uh, I think that this is one of the biggest benefits of tug is this placement of reward. I think it creates a lot of, um, really great drive forward. My dog is not looking at me for the toy because the toy almost never, um, comes from me. The toy mm-hmm. almost, uh, I mean, ultimately it comes from me, but he doesn't come to, he doesn't come to me for the toy. The toy magically, as far as he's concerned, appears three feet in front of his nose, moving away from him on the line that he's on. And this Mm -hmm. really creates a lot of speed, drive, and movement forward. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for those of you who think that this is impossible, I am not like... I'm not like a baseball prodigy from like when I was young, right? I'm not, I'm not like a magical, awesome thrower. She's trying to say she can't throw very well. No, I'm trying to say that I don't have natural talent at throwing very well, but I have developed it through practice. Mm, so my, now my I can. My now apologies. I can throw well, but I couldn't always. So for anybody who's like, oh, well, you know, I can't, I can't throw my toy there. I promise you that if you endeavor to do this, Mm-hmm. You know, over time, if your you dog can learn skill. to weave, you can learn to exactly, throw a toy. Exactly, exactly. You can learn to throw a toy. I will say that I, I think I almost exclusively do throw with my right hand. It doesn't matter what side my dog uh, is on. Yeah, me I too. throw with my right hand. Me too. Yeah. My lefty is not good. Yeah, my lefty is not good either. So the point being that toy is magically going to appear out in front. Then my dog's going to chase it down, bite it. He immediately comes back to me. Uh, we tug. Here's another key part. A little secret here is, uh, it's, we don't just do the five things and then end. We don't just do chase, bite, fight, release, and then go on to the next thing because I almost always, almost always have more than one release and bite and, and probably fight, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's good. He's going to get the toy. He's going to bring it to me. We're going to fight. We're going to release. We are going to bite again, rebite. We're going to fight a little bit more. We're going to release. It's almost always at least, uh, one iteration of that. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the, this is the secret key to having a dog that will release easily mm-hmm. is to, um, is to have them know that just because they let go doesn't mean that they're, they lose the toy or they lose the opportunity to play. Mm-hmm. We actually got an email from someone and this was a tip that we put into our Facebook live training mm-hmm. and we demonstrated the, the rebite called a rebite. You know, you cue the dog to let go. I say thank you. That's mine. I say give. Yeah. So you say give. I say thank you. The dog lets go. And as soon as they let go, I say get it. And so I they say grab get. Onto it. <laughs> yeah. And so we call that little dance, that little move, a rebite. And we give dogs several several rebites. And then it turns out they're much less anxious about giving up the toy because the majority of the time, let's say five out of six times, they get a rebite. And then the sixth time you keep the toy and you go inside they're still going to let go of the toy because, what is that, 83%? I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. Five out of six times, they're going to get the toy right back, like immediately. There's no delay, Mm -hmm. right? Now, of course, for our tricks and demonstration purposes, and sometimes for practical reasons, like when you're taking instruction from your instructor, uh, you may have a delay, right? You ask the dog to let go of the toy, and then they keep their focus on you while you do something or reset a bar or whatever, and then you have them bite again. So that's something that you work up to, that you teach. Anyhow, in this email, it was such a big tip. And then the other thing, the other benefit uh, that this handler uh, shared was that the dogs seemed to be much more intense about tugging in general. 
And we have found this to be universally true. Dogs who get rebites, dogs who are able to get rid of that anxiety over toy and toy possession suddenly have a lot more enthusiasm about tugging, right? It's not this very stressful thing where they want to bite and they try to bite and then the handler's fussing at them. Hey, don't jump on me. Don't take it. It's always very clear. When do I bite? When do I let go? And when something is crystal clear to your dog, when the communication line is open and everybody understands what's going on, drive and enthusiasm, performance, it's all going to go through the roof in a very, very good way. Let me tell you another uh Interesting thought here. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a series of questions. Okay, I'm does, a little scared. I know because I we didn't prep this. So okay, go. I'm gonna put them on the spot. Okay, so does it seem reasonable to you that there are dogs that really love to chase the toy? Like yes. out of all of these things, they love to chase the most. Sure. Okay. Does it seem reasonable to you that there are dogs that really love the retrieve? Yes. They really love to like run after the toy and then also run back. Retrievers and stuff like that. Yes. A little, okay, a little bit less sure. Mostly. Okay, mostly. Okay. Does it make sense to you that there are dogs that really, really love to tug and fight? No doubt. Okay. For sure. So, why would it not also be true that there are dogs who love the bite? The moment that they get to launch at that toy and grab it. Yes. So, I think that's super interesting because let's say we did a functional MRI. We put them in an MRI (laughs) scanner and we could observe what parts of their brain light up the moment they sink their teeth in and then see how those lights change in the next several seconds as they tug. Now, obviously, we can't do that. Right. It's not. There's no way to do that because it's such a, you know, vigorous activity. You have to be very still in the scanner. Um, But I would not be surprised if the areas that lit up on the bite might even be a little bit different from that engaged with uh, the tug or the release or some of those other things. Um, and yeah, I can I can really see that. So, so, the, so the point you're making. So the point I'm making is that I think for some dogs, and I think you can actually develop it, um, they really love that moment of bite. And if you only give them one bite and then a minute of tug, it's great. They like it. But they would actually prefer, they actually enjoy more in a minute time span having uh, four bites, three releases with tug in between. Mm, so right? the total I, time spent. So the total time spent might be the, the same, same, but th- it's actually a better reward for your dog. And the reason that I brought this up is because over time I came to, to realize or I, I believe about my dog that he really loves the bite. I he agree. loves that moment when he, is he a launches little dude. forward. Right, he loves that moment when he launches forward, grabs the toy, and and so um, it's very satisfying to him. Yeah, maybe it's like the first time you bite into a cheesecake, <laughs> and you're just like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, my my point being, I think that um, that's a a secondary benefit of offering rebites is that um, you're also uh, giving your dog more opportunities to bite if that is the part that they enjoy. All right. Well, very cool. I think we've covered a lot of material and hopefully you find this very, very helpful in your training. And if this is something that you are interested in, or if you already know that you have uh, an area in this five part tug thing, the chase, the bite, the fight, the release, the retrieve that needs work, we have a complete guide to tugging online class. If you're listening to this podcast as we put it out, this is a brand new class. If you're listening to this podcast anytime in the future, this is a class that is available for you to register for right now. And it covers all five aspects of tug. So it goes through, there is a module on each of these areas, the chase, the bite, the fight, the release, the retrieve, uh, as well as a lot of tugging games that you can do to help bring out the tug drive in your dog. Um, but it's really designed to hit all of those areas and leave you with a dog that has that full behavior chain of tugging. And uh, you can get to that by going to baddogagility.com slash tugging. There will also be a link to that in the show notes for this episode, episode 252. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hititboard.com. Happy training. My 
My friend comes up to me and says, "What rhymes with orange?" I say, "No, it doesn't."